Hi everyone, I'm Shane Stevenson, Director of Museum Collections and Curator here at the Buffalo Naval Park. And for today's video, we're going to be doing How About Those Clevelands? All right, earlier on our YouTube channel, we published How About Those Fletchers, which I kind of talked a little bit about uh, the growth of the Fletchers uh, from the drawing board uh, right through wartime, uh, wartime modifications. All right, but today I'm standing near the forecastle. It's a little chilly out here today, everybody. Uh, standing near the forecastle of the USS Little Rock, right next to the six-inch turret right here, and right forward of uh, the five-inch mount. And so I'm going to be walking around the ship, talking about the Clevelands, some of their specifications, where they came from, and uh, where they went. Huh, okay. So the Clevelands were born from the Brooklyn class, which itself was a product of the London Naval Treaty of 1930, which put um, specifications on the construction, design, tonnage, and armaments. So they placed restrictions on the building of Navy ships, not only for the U.S., but for many other countries as well. One of those interwar period uh, treaties. Uh, from World War One to World War Two, so the Brooklyns, the, the Brooklyn class cruisers, there were nine of them constructed. The last one being the USS Helena, and really the Helena would be like a parent of the Clevelands, All right? So even with the Brooklyns, there was modifications from the first one, the USS Brooklyn, up to the USS Helena. And so they used that late configuration Brooklyn class on the Helena to design the Clevelands. All right, one of the things that we have here is for the Helena, there were actually three triple turrets on the forecastle. And one of the modifications was they were going to remove one of those six inch turrets on the forecastle or near the bow and place these five inch mounts. So what they had was they had uh, turret one or 61, turret 62, and then forward of the superstructure and aft of the aft superstructure was going to was going to be the five inch mounts that were replacing one of those six inch turrets that were on the deck of the Helena. They also increased uh, the beam a little bit by about two feet from the Helena to the Cleveland classes. So actually, we're going to go walk it. So we're going to head to the center line and we're going to walk that 66 feet. So follow me. So with some of the modifications of the USS Brooklyn from uh, the first in her class, the USS Brooklyn, up to the Helena was because the uh, the Imperial Japanese Navy was creating the Mogami class cruiser and that was seen as a threat to the current standing of the US cruisers and so they made the Brooklyns uh, in response to the Mogami class uh, cruisers from the Imperial Japanese Navy. Now here we have the breezeway right. to, your, to your right is the forward superstructure. To your left is like the deck house in between the forward and aft superstructure. And here we have this breezeway. So we are going to walk it the 66 feet. Now usually in the summertime it's, it's pretty nice here now, but in the summertime this is full of spider webs, so you got to stay low when you walk through this uh, breezeway here. Now we're looking at the Buffalo River, and there's the Buffalo Lighthouse, constructed in 1833. And now we're looking aft, and forward. Right, so the beam was, well, it seems to be about 64 feet. On the Brooklyns, here it's uh, 66 feet and some change. All right, but that all made adjustments to weight, displacement, 
And now we're going to head inside. Well, now it's a little bit warmer down here on the third deck in our sick bay. Uh, this area has, is going to be put back on the tour route this season, which it hasn't been due to COVID restrictions. So we're getting the deck tile repainted. Uh, I'm certainly looking at getting some bedding and stuff. So when people come down here, they have a better feel of maybe the authenticity of uh, the sick bay here on the third deck of USS Little Rock. So as the plans were being created, uh, using the USS Helena was a perfect jumping off point. Talked about removing of the uh, one six inch uh, triple, uh, mo uh, expanding the beam, the width of the ship by two feet. All right, and like the Fletcher class destroyers, the Clevelands became the largest production of class in the world has ever seen. All right, in other videos I talk about just how the U.S. Naval wartime building uh, and shipbuilding uh, dwarfed every other country's combined, and I mean by millions of tons. All right, but there were 26 Clevelands constructed, a 27th was started, but not finished, and not scrapped. So that turned it, that was the USS Galveston, which then became CLG uh, in 1958. So it was started, but it wasn't, it was stopped, but it wasn't scrapped. All right, so with the 26 Clevelands, there was even wartime modification, obviously, between the Cleveland uh, CL-55 and then 26, I don't have the number offhand, uh, but then the 26 Clevelands uh, through uh, the rest of her construction history. All right, so we're going to continue walking around, and I'll continue talking about those Clevelands. So now we're still on the third deck, but we're in X Division. All right, and so very briefly, the X Division answers to the executive officer. All right, so anything that the executive officer uh, requires uh, to do his duty on board, the X Division was there uh, to assist him. All right, so one of the things that they also changed from the Brooklyn to the Clevelands was the amount of armor. All right, they had about 1,800 tons of armor plating and steel on board the USS Brooklyn's, but for the Cleveland's, it was about 1,500. So that was a change. And really, the Cleveland's and the Brooklyn's uh, suffered from being pretty top heavy, uh, and that would affect speed uh, and turning radius. And so they tried to minimize that by shrinking the armor on board uh, the USS Cleveland's. Uh, one of the things that they they kept from the Brooklyn's and earlier classes was the planes, the recon planes on the stern. All right, so the Cleve uh, USS Little Rock in her original configuration would have the two catapults, uh, would have the seaplane hangar, and uh, the crane right at the very stern to be able to reach down, uh, recover the plane in the water, and place it back uh, on the catapult or if it needed to have some repairs to it, then go down to the seaplane hangar right below the main deck. So for today, you see the helipad, uh, where there would have been the, the seaplanes, either the kingfishers or the seahawks, right? And, um, and now we have just the helipad without the crane or anything. All right, let's head somewhere else, and uh, we'll continue chatting. Okay, now we're standing on the first platform on USS Little Rock, and I am in the aft engine room. If you've recently watched uh, Brendan and myself talk about the evaporators on uh, the YouTube uh, video that we just did, uh, this is that same space. And this is because on earlier cruisers, they had one fire room, one engine room. And all of that equipment was crammed into that, those, those two areas. Uh, with the Fletcher class destroyers as well, and the Atlanta class cruisers, uh, and the Clevelands, uh, they were broken up uh, so you'd have alternating systems. A fire room, engine room, fire room, engine room. 
Uh, and that was, again, for redundance, redundancies. If a torpedo would hit, or it took some damage or brought on water, at least you would still have the possibility of maneuvering uh, the ship, right? Uh, so the Cleveland's ended up anywhere from, say, 11,500 tons to about 13,000, 14,000 tons, uh, depending on their load at that particular time. Uh, and that means they had to make adjustments and modifications uh, during, again, during uh, wartime. Uh, one of those areas is the bridge. So I'm going to go from the first platform up to the O3 level, so I'm going to be huffing and puffing it. Follow me. Whew, all right, we made it up to the O3 level in the pilot house. Uh, this is a squared bridge, all right? I don't think it's original to 1945. Um, you know, certainly most of the superstructures uh, were just removed and modified to reflect that changing technology from 1945 to 1960 when she came back as CLG-4. All right, but it is an example of a squared off bridge like we have on USS the Sullivans. And like the Fletcher classes, like the Sullivans, uh, the first few, I think seven, Cleveland classes were constructed with a round bridge with the wings on the side, but it didn't extend all the way forward of the bridge like you'd see here or in the Fletchers. All right, so after uh, CL-64, the USS Vincennes, all of the Cleveland classes did have the rounded, uh, the squared off bridge with the extended bridge outside for sight lines. Um, and there, there was a conning station on those earlier Clevelands down below, uh, and that was modified as well. For those earlier ones, say Cleveland to Vincennes, they were able to add a bridge on top of the pilot house to kind of compensate uh, for sight lines. Certainly there is a lot of question and discussion about anti-aircraft weaponry, things like that. But So like the Fletchers, they, were, they started off with a rounded bridge with the wings that did not extend all the way through, uh, but after the USS Vincennes, uh, CL-64, they did start making the squared off bridge uh, that would be able to be extended all the way around. So here we are in the forward part of the ship now. Uh, I'm standing and leaning against uh, the barbette for turret number one. All right, so in another video, I'm actually inside here, the 6-inch 47, last in the world, though there is uh, part of a turret uh, down in South America. But this is the last intact, and I was inside here for that video, so if you haven't checked that out, please check that out. All right, so talking about the Butcher's Bill of the Clevelands, I've talked about uh, the Fletchers, but the testament of the ruggedness of the class, none of these Cleveland classes were sunk. They were certainly damaged, either by the kamikaze threat or by torpedoes, but none actually sank. And of course, there was certainly loss of life, and we honor those sailors who gave their lives to protect our way of life and to stop uh, the growth of totalitarianism across the globe. Now two Clevelands uh, went to the Mediterranean to wage war against uh, the Italian threat or the Axis power uh, of Italy and that was the Cleveland and the Birmingham. But all other wartime construction these Clevelands were sent right to the Pacific to wage war against the Japanese and to screen the fleet uh, and to protect those aircraft carriers uh, from shore bombardment and also anti-aircraft. Right. The most heavily damaged was the USS Houston, uh, which was torpedoed, and then as she was being tugged away, she was torpedoed a second time. All right, now that shares a story with USS the Sullivans, and I'm pointing over there because that's where she is. Uh, that was part of Cryptiv 1 what Admiral Halsey called Cripple Division 1. There was the USS Canberra and the USS Houston being tugged away, and the Japanese diverted some of their resources to try and sink those cruisers 
and it was part of USS the Sullivan's job to protect them. All right, picket, duty, uh, and screening. And so the USS the Sullivan's did shoot down one plane, but the second torpedo uh, that hit the Houston came from that plane itself. So they were able to shoot it down, but not until she had already released her aerial torpedo. I'll show a picture or two. There was a lot of devastation back there, but she didn't sink. So if you like this video, really appreciate your support. Uh, I'll be doing How About Those Galvestons next. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. A little about the anti-aircraft. Sorry about that. Some of the anti-aircraft weaponry. All right, so they either had... Uh, on the Clevelands, they would either they had a wide array, a uh, lot of modifications based on the Orlicans and the Bofors. All right, so that would have been they could have had 20 single Orlicans stationed around the ship. They could have had 10 uh, twin-barreled Orlicans. All right, so you're still having those 20 barrels, but not singles, but doubles. Uh, they would have had anywhere from 28 Bofors, and that could have been quads or dual, so four-barreled or two-barreled in different configurations. Uh, and now all of that is removed off the Little Rock, uh, so our Bofors and Orlicans are only on our uh, Sullivans, on the USS the Sullivans. All right, so for the, the uh, anti-aircraft weaponry themselves, they would have had a lot, a bunch, you know, 20 barrels of Orlicans, either dual or single, and about 28 Bofors, either in quads or dual uh, mounted. All right, now I hope you like this video, and uh, please subscribe, ring the bell. If you see down below or off to your right, you'll see uh, some suggested videos of ours, and we'll see you again soon. And be on the lookout for How About Those Galvestons. <laughs> All right, take care.